Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Audiobooks from 27audiobooks.com. Part 2. Preface. This part includes five chapters. Chapter 5. Last Mover Advantage. Chapter 6. You Are Not a Lottery Ticket. Chapter 7. Follow the Money. Chapter 8. Secrets. And Chapter 9. Foundations. Chapter 5. Last Mover Advantage. Escaping competition will give you a monopoly, but even a monopoly is only a great business if it can endure in the future. Compare the value of the New York Times company with Twitter. Each employs a few thousand people, and each gives millions of people a way to get news. But when Twitter went public in 2013, it was valued at $24 billion, more than 12 times the Times's market capitalization, even though the Times earned $133 million in 2012 while Twitter lost money. What explains the huge premium for Twitter? The answer is cash flow. This sounds bizarre at first, since the Times was profitable while Twitter wasn't, but a great business is defined by its ability to generate cash flows in the future. Investors expect Twitter will be able to capture monopoly profits over the next decade. While newspapers' monopoly days are over, simply stated, the value of a business today is the sum of all the money it will make in the future. Comparing discounted cash flows shows the difference between low-growth businesses and high-growth startups at its starkest. Most of the value of low-growth businesses is in the near term. An old economy business might hold its value if it can maintain its current cash flows for five or six years. However, any firm with close substitutes will see its profits competed away. Nightclubs or restaurants are extreme examples. Successful ones might collect healthy amounts today, but their cash flows will probably dwindle over the next few years when customers move on to newer and trendier alternatives. Technology companies follow the opposite trajectory. They often lose money for the first few years. It takes time to build valuable things, and that means delayed revenue. Most of a tech company's value will come at least 10 to 15 years in the future. In March 2001, PayPal had yet to make a profit but our revenues were growing 100% year over year. When I projected our future cash flows, I found that 75% of the company's present value would come from profits generated in 2011 and beyond. Hard to believe for a company that had been in business for only 27 months, but even that turned out to be an underestimation. Today, PayPal continues to grow at about 15% annually and the discount rate is lower than a decade ago. It now appears that most of the company's value will come from 2020 and beyond. LinkedIn is another good example of a company whose value exists in the far future. As of early 2014, its market capitalization was $24.5 billion, very high for a company with less than $1 billion in revenue and only $21.6 million in net income for 2012. You might look at these numbers and conclude that investors have gone insane. But this valuation makes sense when you consider LinkedIn's projected future cash flows. The overwhelming importance of future profits is counterintuitive even in Silicon Valley. For a company to be valuable it must grow and endure. But many entrepreneurs focus only on short-term growth. They have an excuse. Growth is easy to measure, but durability isn't. Those who succumb to measurement mania obsess about weekly active user statistics, monthly revenue targets, and quarterly earnings reports. However, you can hit those numbers and still overlook deeper, harder to measure problems that threaten the durability of your business. For example, rapid short-term growth at both Zynga and Groupon distracted managers and investors from long-term challenges. Zynga scored early wins with games like Farmville and claimed to have a psychometric engine to rigorously gauge the appeal of new releases. But they ended up with the same problem as every Hollywood studio. How can you reliably produce a constant stream of popular entertainment for a fickle audience? Groupon posted fast growth as hundreds of thousands of local businesses tried their product. But persuading those businesses to become repeat customers was harder than they thought. If you focus on near-term growth above all else, you miss the most important question you should be asking. Will this business still be around a decade from now? Numbers alone won't tell you the answer. Instead, you must think critically about the qualitative characteristics of your business. Characteristics of monopoly. What does a company with large cash flows far into the future look like? Every monopoly is unique, but they usually share some combination of the following characteristics. Proprietary technology, network effects, economies of scale, and branding. This isn't a list of boxes to check as you build your business. There's no shortcut to monopoly. However, analyzing your business according to these characteristics can help you think about how to make it durable. 1. Proprietary technology. Proprietary technology is the most substantive advantage a company can have because it makes your product difficult or impossible to replicate. Google's search algorithms, for example, return results better than anyone else's. Proprietary technologies for extremely short page load times and highly accurate query autocompletion add to the core search product's robustness and defensibility. 
It would be very hard for anyone to do to Google what Google did to all the other search engine companies in the early 2000s. As a good rule of thumb, proprietary technology must be at least 10 times better than its closest substitute in some important dimension to lead to a real monopolistic advantage. Anything less than an order of magnitude better will probably be perceived as a marginal improvement and will be hard to sell, especially in an already crowded market. The clearest way to make a 10x improvement is to invent something completely new. If you build something valuable where there was nothing before, the increase in value is theoretically infinite, a drug to safely eliminate the need for sleep or a cure for baldness, for example, would certainly support a monopoly business, or you can radically improve an existing solution. Once or 10x better, you escape competition. PayPal, for instance, made buying and selling on eBay at least 10 times better, instead of mailing a check that would take 7 to 10 days to arrive. PayPal let buyers pay as soon as an auction ended, sellers received their proceeds right away, and unlike with a check, they knew the funds were good. Amazon made its first 10x improvement in a particularly visible way. They offered at least 10 times as many books as any other bookstore. When it launched in 1995, Amazon could claim to be Earth's largest bookstore because, unlike a retail bookstore that might stock 100,000 books, Amazon didn't need to physically store any inventory. It simply requested the title from its supplier whenever a customer made an order. This quantum improvement was so effective that a very unhappy Barnes & Noble filed a lawsuit three days before Amazon's IPO, claiming that Amazon was unfairly calling itself a bookstore when really it was a book broker. You can also make a 10x improvement through superior integrated design. Before 2010, tablet computing was so poor that for all practical purposes the market didn't even exist. Microsoft Windows XP Tablet PC Edition products first shipped in 2002 and Nokia released its own internet tablet in 2005, but they were a pain to use. Then Apple released the iPad. Design improvements are hard to measure, but it seems clear that Apple improved on anything that had come before by at least an order of magnitude. Tablets went from unusable to useful. 2. Network effects Network effects make a product more useful as more people use it. For example, if all your friends are on Facebook, it makes sense for you to join Facebook, too. Unilaterally choosing a different social network would only make you an eccentric. Network effects can be powerful, but you'll never reap them unless your product is valuable to its very first users when the network is necessarily small. For example, in 1960 a quixotic company called Zenadu set out to build a two-way communication network between all computers, a sort of early, synchronous version of the World Wide Web. After more than three decades of futile effort, Zenadu folded just as the web was becoming commonplace. Their technology probably would have worked at scale, but it could have worked only at scale. It required every computer to join the network at the same time, and that was never going to happen. Paradoxically, then, network effects businesses must start with especially small markets. Facebook started with just Harvard students. Mark Zuckerberg's first product was designed to get all his classmates signed up, not to attract all people of Earth. This is why successful network businesses rarely get started by MBA types. The initial markets are so small that they often don't even appear to be business opportunities at all. 3. Economies of scale A monopoly business gets stronger as it gets bigger. The fixed costs of creating a product can be spread out over ever greater quantities of sales. Software startups can enjoy especially dramatic economies of scale because the marginal cost of producing another copy of the product is close to zero. Many businesses gain only limited advantages as they grow to large scale. Service businesses especially are difficult to make monopolies. If you own a yoga studio, for example, you'll only be able to serve a certain number of customers. You can hire more instructors and expand to more locations. But your margins will remain fairly low and you'll never reach a point where a core group of talented people can provide something of value to millions of separate clients, as software engineers are able to do. A good startup should have the potential for great scale built into its first design. Twitter already has more than 250 million users today. It doesn't need to add too many customized features in order to acquire more, and there's no inherent reason why it should ever stop growing. 4. Branding A company has a monopoly on its own brand by definition, so creating a strong brand is a powerful way to claim a monopoly. Today's strongest tech brand is Apple. The attractive looks and carefully chosen materials of products like the iPhone and MacBook the Apple stores, sleek minimalist design and close control over the consumer experience, the omnipresent advertising campaigns, the price positioning as a maker of premium goods, and the lingering nimbus of Steve Jobs's personal charisma all contribute to a perception that Apple offers products so good as to constitute a category of their own. Many have tried to learn from Apple's success, paid advertising, branded stores, luxurious materials, playful keynote speeches, high prices, and even minimalist design are all susceptible to imitation.
but these techniques for polishing the surface don't work without a strong underlying substance. Apple has a complex suite of proprietary technologies, both in hardware and software. It manufactures products at a scale large enough to dominate pricing for the materials it buys, and it enjoys strong network effects from its content ecosystem. Thousands of developers write software for Apple devices because that's where hundreds of millions of users are, and those users stay on the platform because it's where the apps are. These other monopolistic advantages are less obvious than Apple's sparkling brand, but they are the fundamentals that let the branding effectively reinforce Apple's monopoly. Beginning with brand rather than substance is dangerous. Ever since Marissa Mayer became CEO of Yahoo! In mid-2012, she has worked to revive the once popular internet giant by making it cool again. In a single tweet, Yahoo! summarized Mayer's plan as a chain reaction of people then products, then traffic then revenue. The people are supposed to come for the coolness. Yahoo! demonstrated design awareness by overhauling its logo. It asserted youthful relevance by acquiring hot startups like Tumblr. And it has gained media attention for Mayer's own star power. But the big question is what products Yahoo! will actually create. When Steve Jobs returned to Apple, he didn't just make Apple a cool place to work. He slashed product lines to focus on the handful of opportunities for 10x improvements. No technology company can be built on branding alone. Building a monopoly. Brand, scale, network effects, and technology in some combination define a monopoly. But to get them to work, you need to choose your market carefully and expand deliberately. Start small and monopolize. Every startup is small at the start. Every monopoly dominates a large share of its market. Therefore, every startup should start with a very small market. Always err on the side of starting too small. The reason is simple. It's easier to dominate a small market than a large one. If you think your initial market might be too big, it almost certainly is. Small doesn't mean non-existent. We made this mistake early on at PayPal. Our first product let people beam money to each other via Palm Pilots. It was interesting technology and no one else was doing it. However, the world's millions of Palm Pilot users weren't concentrated in a particular place, they had little in common, and they used their devices only episodically. Nobody needed our product, so we had no customers. With that lesson learned, we set our sights on eBay auctions, where we found our first success. In late 1999, eBay had a few thousand high-volume power sellers, and after only three months of dedicated effort, we were serving 25% of them. It was much easier to reach a few thousand people who really needed our product than to try to compete for the attention of millions of scattered individuals. The perfect target market for a startup is a small group of particular people concentrated together and served by few or no competitors. Any big market is a bad choice, and a big market already served by competing companies is even worse. This is why it's always a red flag when entrepreneurs talk about getting 1% of a $100 billion market. In practice, a large market will either lack a good starting point or it will be open to competition, so it's hard to ever reach that 1%. And even if you do succeed in gaining a small foothold, you'll have to be satisfied with keeping the lights on. Cutthroat competition means your profits will be zero. Scaling up, once you create and dominate a niche market, then you should gradually expand into related and slightly broader markets. Amazon shows how it can be done. Jeff Bezos' founding vision was to dominate all of online retail, but he very deliberately started with books. There are millions of books to catalog, but they all had roughly the same shape. They were easy to ship, and some of the most rarely sold books, those least profitable for any retail store to keep in stock, also drew the most enthusiastic customers. Amazon became the dominant solution for anyone located far from a bookstore or seeking something unusual. Amazon then had two options, expand the number of people who read books or expand to adjacent markets. They chose the latter, starting with the most similar markets, CDs, videos, and software. Amazon continued to add categories gradually until it had become the world's general store. The name itself brilliantly encapsulated the company's scaling strategy. The biodiversity of the Amazon rainforest reflected Amazon's first goal of cataloging every book in the world, and now it stands for every kind of thing in the world, period. eBay also started by dominating small niche markets. When it launched its auction marketplace in 1995, it didn't need the whole world to adopt it at once. The product worked well for intense interest groups like Beanie Baby obsessives. Once it monopolized the Beanie Baby trade, eBay didn't jump straight to listing sports cars or industrial surplus. It continued to cater to small-time hobbyists until it became the most reliable marketplace for people trading online no matter what the item. Sometimes there are hidden obstacles to scaling, a lesson that eBay has learned in recent years. Like all marketplaces, the auction marketplace lent itself to natural monopoly because buyers go where the sellers are and vice versa. 
but eBay found that the auction model works best for individually distinctive products like coins and stamps. It works less well for commodity products. People don't want to bid on pencils or Kleenex, so it's more convenient just to buy them from Amazon. eBay is still a valuable monopoly. It's just smaller than people in 2004 expected it to be. Sequencing markets correctly is underrated, and it takes discipline to expand gradually. The most successful companies make the core progression, to first dominate a specific niche and then scale to adjacent markets, a part of their founding narrative. Don't disrupt. Silicon Valley has become obsessed with disruption. Originally, disruption was a term of art to describe how a firm can use new technology to introduce a low-end product at low prices, improve the product over time, and eventually overtake even the premium products offered by incumbent companies using older technology. This is roughly what happened when the advent of PCs disrupted the market for mainframe computers. At first PCs seemed irrelevant, then they became dominant. Today mobile devices may be doing the same thing to PCs. However, disruption has recently transmogrified into a self-congratulatory buzzword for anything posing as trendy and new. This seemingly trivial fad matters because it distorts an entrepreneur's self-understanding in an inherently competitive way. The concept was coined to describe threats to incumbent companies. So startups' obsession with disruption means they see themselves through older firms' eyes. If you think of yourself as an insurgent battling dark forces, it's easy to become unduly fixated on the obstacles in your path. But if you truly want to make something new, the act of creation is far more important than the old industries that might not like what you create. Indeed, if your company can be summed up by its opposition to already existing firms, it can't be completely new and it's probably not going to become a monopoly. Disruption also attracts attention. Disruptors are people who look for trouble and find it. Disruptive kids get sent to the principal's office. Disruptive companies often pick fights they can't win. Think of Napster. The name itself meant trouble. What kinds of things can one nap? Music, kids, and perhaps not much else. Sean Fanning and Sean Parker, Napster's then-teenage founders, credibly threatened to disrupt the powerful music recording industry in 1999. The next year, they made the cover of Time magazine. A year and a half after that, they ended up in bankruptcy court. PayPal could be seen as disruptive, but we didn't try to directly challenge any large competitor. It's true that we took some business away from Visa when we popularized internet payments. You might use PayPal to buy something online instead of using your Visa card to buy it in a store. But since we expanded the market for payments overall, we gave Visa far more business than we took. The overall dynamic was net positive, unlike Napster's negative sum struggle with the U.S. recording industry. As you craft a plan to expand to adjacent markets, don't disrupt, avoid competition as much as possible. The last will be first. You've probably heard about first mover advantage. If you're the first entrant into a market, you can capture significant market share while competitors scramble to get started. But moving first is a tactic, not a goal. What really matters is generating cash flows in the future, so being the first mover doesn't do you any good if someone else comes along and unseats you. It's much better to be the last mover. That is, to make the last great development in a specific market and enjoy years or even decades of monopoly profits. The way to do that is to dominate a small niche and scale up from there, toward your ambitious long-term vision. In this one particular at least, business is like chess. Grandmaster Jose Raul Capablanca put it well. To succeed, you must study the end game before everything else. Chapter 6. You are not a lottery ticket. The most contentious question in business is whether success comes from luck or skill. What do successful people say? Malcolm Gladwell, a successful author who writes about successful people, declares in Outliers that success results from a patchwork of lucky breaks and arbitrary advantages. Warren Buffett famously considers himself a member of the Lucky Sperm Club and a winner of the Ovarian Lottery. Jeff Bezos attributes Amazon's success to an incredible planetary alignment and jokes that it was half luck, half good timing, and the rest brains. Bill Gates even goes so far as to claim that he was lucky to be born with certain skills, though it's not clear whether that's actually possible. Perhaps these guys are being strategically humble. However, the phenomenon of serial entrepreneurship would seem to call into question our tendency to explain success as the product of chance. Hundreds of people have started multiple multimillion dollar businesses. A few, like Steve Jobs, Jack Dorsey, and Elon Musk, have created several multi-billion dollar companies. If success were mostly a matter of luck, these kinds of serial entrepreneurs probably wouldn't exist. In January 2013, Jack Dorsey, founder of Twitter and Square, tweeted to his 2 million followers, success is never accidental. Most of the replies were unambiguously negative. Referencing the tweet in The Atlantic, reporter Alexis Madrigal wrote that his instinct was to reply, success is never accidental, said all multimillionaire white men. 
It's true that already successful people have an easier time doing new things, whether due to their networks, wealth, or experience. But perhaps we've become too quick to dismiss anyone who claims to have succeeded according to plan. Is there a way to settle this debate objectively? Unfortunately not, because companies are not experiments. To get a scientific answer about Facebook, for example, we'd have to rewind to 2004, create 1,000 copies of the world, and start Facebook in each copy to see how many times it would succeed. But that experiment is impossible. Every company starts in unique circumstances, and every company starts only once. Statistics doesn't work when the sample size is one. From the Renaissance and the Enlightenment to the mid-20th century, luck was something to be mastered, dominated, and controlled. Everyone agreed that you should do what you could, not focus on what you couldn't. Ralph Waldo Emerson captured this ethos when he wrote, Shallow men believe in luck, believe in circumstances, strong men believe in cause and effect. In 1912, after he became the first explorer to reach the South Pole, Roald Amundsen wrote, Victory awaits him who has everything in order, luck, people call it. No one pretended that misfortune didn't exist, but prior generations believed in making their own luck by working hard. If you believe your life is mainly a matter of chance, why read this book? Learning about startups is worthless if you're just reading stories about people who won the lottery. Slot machines for dummies can purport to tell you which kind of rabbit's foot to rub or how to tell which machines are hot, but it can't tell you how to win. Did Bill Gates simply win the intelligence lottery? Was Sheryl Sandberg born with a silver spoon, or did she lean in? When we debate historical questions like these, luck is in the past tense. Far more important are questions about the future. Is it a matter of chance or design? Can you control your future? You can expect the future to take a definite form or you can treat it as hazily uncertain. If you treat the future as something definite, it makes sense to understand it in advance and to work to shape it. But if you expect an indefinite future ruled by randomness, you'll give up on trying to master it. Indefinite attitudes to the future explain what's most dysfunctional in our world today. Process trumps substance. When people lack concrete plans to carry out, they use formal rules to assemble a portfolio of various options. This describes Americans today. In middle school, we're encouraged to start hoarding extracurricular activities. In high school, ambitious students compete even harder to appear omnicompetent. By the time a student gets to college, he's spent a decade curating a bewilderingly diverse resume to prepare for a completely unknowable future. Come what may, he's ready for nothing in particular. A definite view, by contrast, favors firm convictions. Instead of pursuing manicided mediocrity and calling it well-roundedness, a definite person determines the one best thing to do and then does it. Instead of working tirelessly to make herself indistinguishable, she strives to be great at something substantive, to be a monopoly of one. This is not what young people do today, because everyone around them has long since lost faith in a definite world. No one gets into Stanford by excelling at just one thing, unless that thing happens to involve throwing or catching a leather ball. You can also expect the future to be either better or worse than the present. Optimists welcome the future, pessimists fear it. Combining these possibilities yields four views. Indefinite pessimism. Every culture has a myth of decline from some golden age, and almost all peoples throughout history have been pessimists. Even today pessimism still dominates huge parts of the world. An indefinite pessimist looks out onto a bleak future, but he has no idea what to do about it. This describes Europe since the early 1970s, when the continent succumbed to undirected bureaucratic drift. Today the whole eurozone is in slow motion crisis, and nobody is in charge. The European Central Bank doesn't stand for anything but improvisation. The US, Treasury prints and God we trust on the dollar, the ECB might as well print kick the can down the road on the euro. Europeans just react to events as they happen and hope things don't get worse. The indefinite pessimist can't know whether the inevitable decline will be fast or slow, catastrophic or gradual. All he can do is wait for it to happen, so he might as well eat, drink, and be merry in the meantime, hence Europe's famous vacation mania. Definite Pessimism A definite pessimist believes the future can be known, but since it will be bleak, he must prepare for it. Perhaps surprisingly, China is probably the most definitely pessimistic place in the world today. When Americans see the Chinese economy grow ferociously fast, we imagine a confident country mastering its future. But that's because Americans are still optimists, and we project our optimism onto China. From China's viewpoint, economic growth cannot come fast enough. Every other country is afraid that China is going to take over the world. China is the only country afraid that it won't. China can grow so fast only because its starting base is so low. The easiest way for China to grow is to relentlessly copy what has already worked in the West. And that's exactly what it's doing. Executing definite plans by burning ever more coal to build ever more factories and skyscrapers. But with a huge population pushing resource prices higher, 
There's no way Chinese living standards can ever actually catch up to those of the richest countries, and the Chinese know it. This is why the Chinese leadership is obsessed with the way in which things threaten to get worse. Every senior Chinese leader experienced famine as a child. So when the Politburo looks to the future, disaster is not an abstraction. The Chinese public, too, knows that winter is coming. Outsiders are fascinated by the great fortunes being made inside China, but they pay less attention to the wealthy Chinese trying hard to get their money out of the country. Poorer Chinese just save everything they can and hope it will be enough. Every class of people in China takes the future deadly seriously. Definite Optimism To a definite optimist, the future will be better than the present if he plans and works to make it better. From the 17th century through the 1950s and 60s, definite optimists led the Western world. Scientists, engineers, doctors, and businessmen made the world richer, healthier, and more long-lived than previously imaginable. As Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels saw clearly, the 19th century business class created more massive and more colossal productive forces than all preceding generations together. Subjection of nature's forces to man, machinery, application of chemistry to industry and agriculture, steam navigation, railways, electric telegraphs, clearing of whole continents for cultivation, canalization of rivers, whole populations conjured out of the ground. What earlier century had even a presentiment that such productive forces slumbered in the lap of social labor? Each generation's inventors and visionaries surpassed their predecessors. In 1843, the London public was invited to make its first crossing underneath the River Thames by a newly dug tunnel. In 1869, the Suez Canal saved Eurasian shipping traffic from rounding the Cape of Good Hope. In 1914 the Panama Canal cut short the route from Atlantic to Pacific. Even the Great Depression failed to impede relentless progress in the United States, which has always been home to the world's most far-seeing definite optimist. The Empire State Building was started in 1929 and finished in 1931. The Golden Gate Bridge was started in 1933 and completed in 1937. The Manhattan Project was started in 1941 and had already produced the world's first nuclear bomb by 1945. Americans continued to remake the face of the world in peacetime. The interstate highway system began construction in 1956, and the first 20,000 miles of road were open for driving by 1965. Definite planning even went beyond the surface of this planet. NASA's Apollo program began in 1961 and put 12 men on the moon before it finished in 1972. Bold plans were not reserved just for political leaders or government scientists. In the late 1940s, a Californian named John Riber set out to reinvent the physical geography of the whole San Francisco Bay Area. Riber was a schoolteacher, an amateur theater producer, and a self-taught engineer. Undaunted by his lack of credentials, he publicly proposed to build two huge dams in the bay, construct massive freshwater lakes for drinking water and irrigation, and reclaim 20,000 acres of land for development. Even though he had no personal authority, people took the river plan seriously. It was endorsed by newspaper editorial boards across California, the U.S. Congress held hearings on its feasibility. The Army Corps of Engineers even constructed a 1.5-acre scale model of the bay in a cavernous Sausalito warehouse to simulate it. These tests revealed technical shortcomings, so the plan wasn't executed. But would anybody today take such a vision seriously in the first place? In the 1950s, people welcomed big plans and asked whether they would work. Today a grand plan coming from a schoolteacher would be dismissed as crankery, and a long-range vision coming from anyone more powerful would be derided as hubris. You can still visit the Bay Model in that Sausalito warehouse, but today it's just a tourist attraction. Big plans for the future have become archaic curiosity. In the 1950s, Americans thought big plans for the future were too important to be left to experts. Indefinite Optimism After a brief pessimistic phase in the 1970s, indefinite optimism has dominated American thinking ever since 1982, when a long bull market began and finance eclipsed engineering as the way to approach the future. To an indefinite optimist, the future will be better, but he doesn't know how exactly, so he won't make any specific plans. He expects to profit from the future but sees no reason to design it concretely. Instead of working for years to build a new product, indefinite optimists rearrange already invented ones. Bankers make money by rearranging the capital structures of already existing companies. Lawyers resolve disputes over old things or help other people structure their affairs. And private equity investors and management consultants don't start new businesses. They squeeze extra efficiency from old ones with incessant procedural optimizations. It's no surprise that these fields all attract disproportionate numbers of high-achieving Ivy League optionality chasers. What could be a more appropriate reward for two decades of resume building than a seemingly elite, process-oriented career that promises to keep options open? Recent graduates' parents often cheer them on the established path. 
The strange history of the baby boom produced a generation of indefinite optimists so used to effortless progress that they feel entitled to it. Whether you were born in 1945 or 1950 or 1955, things got better every year for the first 18 years of your life, and it had nothing to do with you. Technological advance seemed to accelerate automatically, so the boomers grew up with great expectations but few specific plans for how to fulfill them. Then, when technological progress stalled in the 1970s, increasing income inequality came to the rescue of the most elite boomers. Every year of adulthood continued to get automatically better and better for the rich and successful. The rest of their generation was left behind. But the wealthy boomers who shape public opinion today see little reason to question their naive optimism. Since track careers worked for them, they can't imagine that they won't work for their kids, too. Malcolm Gladwell says you can't understand Bill Gates' success without understanding his fortunate personal context. He grew up in a good family, went to a private school equipped with a computer lab, and counted Paul Allen as a childhood friend. But perhaps you can't understand Malcolm Gladwell without understanding his historical context as a boomer. When baby boomers grow up and write books to explain why one or another individual is successful, they point to the power of a particular individual's context as determined by chance. But they miss the even bigger social context for their own preferred explanations. A whole generation learned from childhood to overrate the power of chance and underrate the importance of planning. Gladwell at first appears to be making a contrary and critique of the myth of the self-made businessman, but actually his own account encapsulates the conventional view of a generation. Our indefinitely optimistic world. Indefinite finance While a definitely optimistic future would need engineers to design underwater cities and settlements in space, an indefinitely optimistic future calls for more bankers and lawyers. Finance epitomizes indefinite thinking because it's the only way to make money when you have no idea how to create wealth. If they don't go to law school, Bright college graduates head to Wall Street precisely because they have no real plan for their careers. And once they arrive at Goldman, they find that even inside finance, everything is indefinite. It's still optimistic. You wouldn't play in the markets if you expected to lose. But the fundamental tenet is that the market is random, you can't know anything specific or substantive, diversification becomes supremely important. The indefiniteness of finance can be bizarre. Think about what happens when successful entrepreneurs sell their company. What do they do with the money? In a financialized world, it unfolds like this. The founders don't know what to do with it, so they give it to a large bank. The bankers don't know what to do with it, so they diversify by spreading it across a portfolio of institutional investors. Institutional investors don't know what to do with their managed capital, so they diversify by amassing a portfolio of stocks. Companies try to increase their share price by generating free cash flows. If they do, they issue dividends or buy back shares and the cycle repeats. At no point does anyone in the chain know what to do with money in the real economy. But in an indefinite world, people actually prefer unlimited optionality. Money is more valuable than anything you could possibly do with it. Only in a definite future is money a means to an end, not the end itself. Indefinite politics Politicians have always been officially accountable to the public at election time. But today they are attuned to what the public thinks at every moment. Modern polling enables politicians to tailor their image to match pre-existing public opinion exactly, so for the most part, they do. Nate Silver's election predictions are remarkably accurate, but even more remarkable is how big a story they become every four years. We are more fascinated today by statistical predictions of what the country will be thinking in a few weeks' time than by visionary predictions of what the country will look like 10 or 20 years from now. And it's not just the electoral process. The very character of government has become indefinite, too. The government used to be able to coordinate complex solutions to problems like atomic weaponry and lunar exploration. But today, after 40 years of indefinite creep, the government mainly just provides insurance. Our solutions to big problems are Medicare, Social Security, and a dizzying array of other transfer payment programs. It's no surprise that entitlement spending has eclipsed discretionary spending every year since 1975. To increase discretionary spending we'd need definite plans to solve specific problems. But according to the indefinite logic of entitlement spending, we can make things better just by sending out more checks. Indefinite philosophy You can see the shift to an indefinite attitude not just in politics but in the political philosophers whose ideas underpin both left and right. The philosophy of the ancient world was pessimistic. Plato, Aristotle, Epicurus, and Lucretius all accepted strict limits on human potential. The only question was how best to cope with our tragic fate. Modern philosophers have been mostly optimistic. From Herbert Spencer on the right and Hegel in the center to Marx on the left, the 19th century shared a belief in progress. These thinkers expected material advances to fundamentally change human life for the better. They were definite optimists. In the late 20th century, 
indefinite philosophies came to the fore. The two dominant political thinkers, John Rawls and Robert Nozick, are usually seen as stark opposites on the egalitarian left. Rawls was concerned with questions of fairness and distribution. On the libertarian right, Nozick focused on maximizing individual freedom. They both believed that people could get along with each other peacefully, so unlike the ancients, they were optimistic. But unlike Spencer or Marx, Rawls and Nozick were indefinite optimists. They didn't have any specific vision of the future. Their indefiniteness took different forms. Rawls begins a theory of justice with the famous veil of ignorance. Fair political reasoning is supposed to be impossible for anyone with knowledge of the world as it concretely exists. Instead of trying to change our actual world of unique people and real technologies, Rawls fantasized about an inherently stable society with lots of fairness, but little dynamism. Nozick opposed Rawls's pattern concept of justice. To Nozick, any voluntary exchange must be allowed, and no social pattern could be noble enough to justify maintenance by coercion. He didn't have any more concrete ideas about the good society than Rawls. Both of them focused on process. Nozick opposed Rawls's pattern concept of justice. To Nozick, any voluntary exchange must be allowed, and no social pattern could be noble enough to justify maintenance by coercion. He didn't have any more concrete ideas about the good society than Rawls. Both of them focused on process. Today, we exaggerate the differences between left liberal egalitarianism and libertarian individualism because almost everyone shares their common and definite attitude. In philosophy, politics, and business, too, arguing over process has become a way to endlessly defer making concrete plans for a better future. Indefinite life. Our ancestors sought to understand and extend the human lifespan. In the 16th century, conquistadors searched the jungles of Florida for a fountain of youth. Francis Bacon wrote that the prolongation of life should be considered its own branch of medicine and the noblest. In the 1660s, Robert Boyle placed life extension atop his famous wish list for the future of science. Whether through geographic exploration or laboratory research, the best minds of the Renaissance thought of death as something to defeat. We haven't yet uncovered the secrets of life, but insurers and statisticians in the 19th century successfully revealed a secret about death that still governs our thinking today. They discovered how to reduce it to a mathematical probability. Life tables tell us our chances of dying in any given year, something previous generations didn't know. However, in exchange for better insurance contracts, we seem to have given up the search for secrets about longevity. Systematic knowledge of the current range of human lifespans has made that range seem natural. Today our society is permeated by the twin ideas that death is both inevitable and random. Meanwhile, probabilistic attitudes have come to shape the agenda of biology itself. In 1928, Scottish scientist Alexander Fleming found that a mysterious antibacterial fungus had grown on a petri dish he'd forgotten to cover in his laboratory. He discovered penicillin by accident. Scientists have sought to harness the power of chance ever since. Modern drug discovery aims to amplify Fleming's serendipitous circumstances a millionfold. Pharmaceutical companies search through combinations of molecular compounds at random, hoping to find a hit, but it's not working as well as it used to. Despite dramatic advances over the past two centuries, in recent decades biotechnology hasn't met the expectations of investors or patients. Arum's law, that's Moore's law backward, observes that the number of new drugs approved per billion dollars spent on R&D has halved every nine years since 1950, since information technology accelerated faster than ever during those same years. The big question for biotech today is whether it will ever see similar progress. Compare biotech startups to their counterparts in computer software. Biotech startups are an extreme example of indefinite thinking. Researchers experiment with things that just might work instead of refining definite theories about how the body's systems operate. Biologists say they need to work this way because the underlying biology is hard. According to them, its startups work because we created computers ourselves and designed them to reliably obey our commands. Biotech is difficult because we didn't design our bodies, and the more we learn about them, the more complex they turn out to be. But today it's possible to wonder whether the genuine difficulty of biology has become an excuse for biotech startups' indefinite approach to business in general. Most of the people involved expect some things to work eventually, but few want to commit to a specific company with the level of intensity necessary for success. It starts with the professors who often become part-time consultants instead of full-time employees. Even for the biotech startups that begin from their own research, then everyone else imitates the professor's indefinite attitude. It's easy for libertarians to claim that heavy regulation holds biotech back, and it does, but indefinite optimism may pose an even greater challenge for the future of biotech. Is indefinite optimism even possible? What kind of future will our indefinitely optimistic decisions bring about?
If American households were saving, at least they could expect to have money to spend later. And if American companies were investing, they could expect to reap the rewards of new wealth in the future. But U.S. households are saving almost nothing. And U.S. companies are letting cash pile up on their balance sheets without investing in new projects because they don't have any concrete plans for the future. The other three views of the future can work. Definite optimism works when you build the future you envision. Definite pessimism works by building what can be copied without expecting anything new. Indefinite pessimism works because it's self-fulfilling. If you're a slacker with low expectations, they'll probably be met. But indefinite optimism seems inherently unsustainable. How can the future get better if no one plans for it? Actually, most everybody in the modern world has already heard an answer to this question. Progress without planning is what we call evolution. Darwin himself wrote that life tends to progress without anybody intending it. Every living thing is just a random iteration on some other organism. And the best iterations win. Darwin's theory explains the origin of trilobites and dinosaurs, but can it be extended to domains that are far removed, just as Newtonian physics can't explain black holes or the Big Bang? It's not clear that Darwinian biology should explain how to build a better society or how to create a new business out of nothing. Yet in recent years Darwinian metaphors have become common in business. Journalists analogize literal survival in competitive ecosystems to corporate survival in competitive market. Hence all the headlines like Digital Darwinism, Dotcom Darwinism, and Survival of the Clickiest, even in engineering-driven Silicon Valley. The buzzwords of the moment call for building a lean startup that can adapt and evolve to an ever-changing environment. Would-be entrepreneurs are told that nothing can be known in advance. We're supposed to listen to what customers say they want make nothing more than a minimum viable product, and iterate our way to success. But leanness is a methodology, not a goal. Making small changes to things that already exist might lead you to a local maximum, but it won't help you find the global maximum. You could build the best version of an app that lets people order toilet paper from their iPhone, but iteration without a bold plan won't take you from zero to one. A company is the strangest place of all for an indefinite optimist. Why should you expect your own business to succeed without a plan to make it happen? Darwinism may be a fine theory in other contexts, but in startups, intelligent design works best. The return of design. What would it mean to prioritize design over chance? Today, good design is an aesthetic imperative, and everybody from slackers to yuppies carefully curates their outward appearance. It's true that every great entrepreneur is first and foremost a designer. Anyone who has held an eye device or a smoothly machined MacBook has felt the result of Steve Jobs' obsession with visual and experiential perfection. But the most important lesson to learn from Jobs has nothing to do with aesthetics. The greatest thing Jobs designed was his business. Apple imagined and executed definite multi-year plans to create new products and distribute them effectively. Forget minimum viable products. Ever since he started Apple in 1976, Jobs saw that you can change the world through careful planning, not by listening to focus group feedback or copying others' successes. Long-term planning is often undervalued by our indefinite short-term world. When the first iPod was released in October 2001, industry analysts couldn't see much more than a nice feature for Macintosh users that doesn't make any difference to the rest of the world. Jobs planned the iPod to be the first of a new generation of portable post-PC devices, but that secret was invisible to most people. One look at the company's stock chart shows the harvest of this multi-year plan. The power of planning explains the difficulty of valuing private companies. When a big company makes an offer to acquire a successful startup, it almost always offers too much or too little. Founders only sell when they have no more concrete visions for the company, in which case the acquirer probably overpaid. Definite founders with robust plans don't sell, which means the offer wasn't high enough. When Yahoo offered to buy Facebook for $1 billion in July 2006, I thought we should at least consider it. But Mark Zuckerberg walked into the board meeting and announced, OK, guys, this is just a formality. It shouldn't take more than 10 minutes. We're obviously not going to sell here. Mark saw where he could take the company, and Yahoo didn't. A business with a good definite plan will always be underrated in a world where people see the future as random. You are not a lottery ticket. We have to find our way back to a definite future. And the Western world needs nothing short of a cultural revolution to do it. Where to start? John Rawls will need to be displaced in philosophy departments. Malcolm Gladwell must be persuaded to change his theories. And pollsters have to be driven from politics. But the philosophy professors and the Gladwells of the world are set in their ways, to say nothing of our politicians. It's extremely hard to make changes in those crowded fields, even with brains and good intentions. A startup is the largest endeavor over which you can have definite mastery. You can have agency not just over your own life, but over a small and important part of the world. It begins by rejecting the unjust tyranny of chance. You are not a lottery ticket. 
Chapter 7 Follow the Money Money makes money. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Albert Einstein made the same observation when he stated that compound interest was the eighth wonder of the world, the greatest mathematical discovery of all time, or even the most powerful force in the universe. Whichever version you prefer, you can't miss his message, never underestimate exponential growth. Actually, there's no evidence that Einstein ever said any of those things, the quotations are all apocryphal. But this very misattribution reinforces the message. Having invested the principle of a lifetime's brilliance, Einstein continues to earn interest on it from beyond the grave by receiving credit for things he never said. Most sayings are forgotten. At the other extreme, a select few people like Einstein and Shakespeare are constantly quoted in ventriloquist. We shouldn't be surprised, since small minorities often achieve disproportionate results. In 1906, economist Vilfredo Pareto discovered what became the Pareto Principle, or the 80-20 rule when he noticed that 20% of the people owned 80% of the land in Italy, a phenomenon that he found just as natural as the fact that 20% of the pea pods in his garden produced 80% of the peas. This extraordinarily stark pattern, in which a small few radically outstrip all rivals, surrounds us everywhere in the natural and social world. The most destructive earthquakes are many times more powerful than all smaller earthquakes combined. The biggest cities dwarf all mere towns put together and monopoly businesses capture more value than millions of undifferentiated competitors. Whatever Einstein did or didn't say, the power law, so named because exponential equations describe severely unequal distributions, is the law of the universe. It defines our surroundings so completely that we usually don't even see it. This chapter shows how the power law becomes visible when you follow the money in venture capital, where investors try to profit from exponential growth in early-stage companies. A few companies attain exponentially greater value than all others. Most businesses never need to deal with venture capital. But everyone needs to know exactly one thing that even venture capitalists struggle to understand. We don't live in a normal world. We live under a power law. The Power Law of Venture Capital Venture capitalists aim to identify, fund, and profit from promising early-stage companies. They raise money from institutions and wealthy people, pull it into a fund and invest in technology companies that they believe will become more valuable. If they turn out to be right, they take a cut of the returns, usually 20%. A venture fund makes money when the companies in its portfolio become more valuable and either go public or get bought by larger companies. Venture funds usually have a 10-year lifespan since it takes time for successful companies to grow and exit. But most venture-backed companies don't IPO or get acquired. Most fail, usually soon after they start. Due to these early failures, a venture fund typically loses money at first. VCs hope the value of the fund will increase dramatically in a few years' time, to break even and beyond, when the successful portfolio companies hit their exponential growth spurts and start to scale. The big question is when this takeoff will happen. For most funds, the answer is never. Most startups fail, and most funds fail with them. Every VC knows that his task is to find the companies that will succeed. However, even seasoned investors understand this phenomenon only superficially. They know companies are different, but they underestimate the degree of difference. The error lies in expecting that venture returns will be normally distributed. That is, bad companies will fail, mediocre ones will stay flat, and good ones will return 2x or even 4x. Assuming this bland pattern, investors assemble a diversified portfolio and hope that winners counterbalance losers. But this spray-and-pray approach usually produces an entire portfolio of flops, with no hits at all. This is because venture returns don't follow a normal distribution overall. Rather, they follow a power law. A small handful of companies radically outperform all others. If you focus on diversification instead of single-minded pursuit of the very few companies that can become overwhelmingly valuable, you'll miss those rare companies in the first place. This graph shows the stark reality versus the perceived relative homogeneity. Our results at Founders Fund illustrate this skewed pattern. Facebook, the best investment in our 2005 fund, returned more than all the others combined. Palantir, the second best investment, is set to return more than the sum of every other investment aside from Facebook. This highly uneven pattern is not unusual. We see it in all our other funds as well. The biggest secret in venture capital is that the best investment in a successful fund equals or outperforms the entire rest of the fund combined. This implies two very strange rules for VCs. First, only invest in companies that have the potential to return the value of the entire fund. This is a scary rule, because it eliminates the vast majority of possible investments. This leads to rule number two. Because rule number one is so restrictive, there can't be any other rules. Consider what happens when you break the first rule. Andreessen Horowitz invested $250,000 in Instagram in 2010. 
when Facebook bought Instagram just two years later for $1 billion. Andreessen netted $78 million, a 312x return in less than two years. That's a phenomenal return, befitting the firm's reputation as one of the Valley's best. But in a weird way it's not nearly enough, because Andreessen Horowitz has a $1.5 billion fund. If they only wrote $250,000 checks, they would need to find 19 Instagrams just to break even. This is why investors typically put a lot more money into any company worth funding. VCs must find the handful of companies that will successfully go from zero to one and then back them with every resource. Of course, no one can know with certainty ex ante which companies will succeed, so even the best VC firms have a portfolio. However, every single company in a good venture portfolio must have the potential to succeed at vast scale. At Founders Fund, we focus on five to seven companies in a fund, each of which we think could become a multi-billion dollar business based on its unique fundamentals. Whenever you shift from the substance of a business to the financial question of whether or not it fits into a diversified hedging strategy, venture investing starts to look a lot like buying lottery tickets. And once you think that you're playing the lottery, you've already psychologically prepared yourself to lose. Why people don't see the power law. Why would professional VCs, of all people, fail to see the power law? For one thing, it only becomes clear over time, and even technology investors too often live in the present. Imagine a firm invests in 10 companies with the potential to become monopolies, already an unusually disciplined portfolio. Those companies will look very similar in the early stages before exponential growth. Over the next few years, some companies will fail while others begin to succeed. Valuations will diverge, but the difference between exponential growth and linear growth will be unclear. After 10 years, however, the portfolio won't be divided between winners and losers. It will be split between one dominant investment and everything else. But no matter how unambiguous the end result of the power law, it doesn't reflect daily experience. Since investors spend most of their time making new investments and attending to companies in their early stages, most of the companies they work with are by definition average. Most of the differences that investors and entrepreneurs perceive every day are between relative levels of success, not between exponential dominance and failure. And since nobody wants to give up on an investment, VCs usually spend even more time on the most problematic companies than they do on the most obviously successful. If even investors specializing in exponentially growing startups miss the power law, it's not surprising that most everyone else misses it, too. Power law distributions are so big that they hide in plain sight. For example, when most people outside Silicon Valley think of venture capital, they might picture a small and quirky coterie like ABC's Shark Tank, only without commercials. After all, less than 1% of new businesses started each year in the U.S. receive venture funding and total VC investment accounts for less than 0.2% of GDP. But the results of those investments disproportionately propel the entire economy. Venture-backed companies create 11% of all private sector jobs. They generate annual revenues equivalent to an astounding 21% of GDP. Indeed, the dozen largest tech companies were all venture-backed. Together those 12 companies are worth more than $2 trillion, more than all other tech companies combined. What to do with the power law? The power law is not just important to investors, rather, it's important to everybody because everybody is an investor. An entrepreneur makes a major investment just by spending her time working on a startup. Therefore every entrepreneur must think about whether her company is going to succeed and become valuable. Every individual is unavoidably an investor, too. When you choose a career, you act on your belief that the kind of work you do will be valuable decades from now. The most common answer to the question of future value is a diversified portfolio. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, everyone has been told. As we said, even the best venture investors have a portfolio. But investors who understand the power law make as few investments as possible. The kind of portfolio thinking embraced by both folk wisdom and financial convention, by contrast, regards diversified betting as a source of strength. The more you dabble, the more you are supposed to have hedged against the uncertainty of the future. But life is not a portfolio, not for a startup founder, and not for any individual. An entrepreneur cannot diversify herself. You cannot run dozens of companies at the same time and then hope that one of them works out well. Less obvious but just as important, an individual cannot diversify his own life by keeping dozens of equally possible careers in ready reserve. Our schools teach the opposite. Institutionalized education traffics in a kind of homogenized, generic knowledge. Everybody who passes through the American school system learns not to think in power law terms. Every high school course period lasts 45 minutes whatever the subject. Every student proceeds at a similar pace. 
At college, model students obsessively hedge their futures by assembling a suite of exotic and minor skills. Every university believes in excellence, and hundred-page course catalogs arranged alphabetically according to arbitrary. Departments of knowledge seem designed to reassure you that it doesn't matter what you do, as long as you do it well. That is completely false. It does matter what you do. You should focus relentlessly on something you're good at doing. But before that you must think hard about whether it will be valuable in the future. For the startup world, this means you should not necessarily start your own company, even if you are extraordinarily talented. If anything, too many people are starting their own companies today. People who understand the power law will hesitate more than others when it comes to founding a new venture. They know how tremendously successful they could become by joining the very best company while it's growing fast. The power law means that differences between companies will dwarf the differences in roles inside companies. You could have 100% of the equity if you fully fund your own venture, but if it fails you'll have 100% of nothing. Owning just 0.01% of Google, by contrast, is incredibly valuable. If you do start your own company, you must remember the power law to operate it well. The most important things are singular. One market will probably be better than all others, as we discussed in Chapter 5. One distribution strategy usually dominates all others. Two, for that see Chapter 11. Time and decision-making themselves follow a power law, and some moments matter far more than others, see Chapter 9. However, you can't trust a world that denies the power law to accurately frame your decisions for you, so what's most important is rarely obvious. It might even be secret, but in a power law world, you can't afford not to think hard about where your actions will fall on the curve. Chapter 8. Secrets. Every one of today's most famous and familiar ideas was once unknown and unsuspected. The mathematical relationship between a triangle's sides, for example, was secret for millennia. Pythagoras had to think hard to discover it. If you wanted in on Pythagoras's new discovery, joining his strange vegetarian cult was the best way to learn about it. Today, his geometry has become a convention, a simple truth we teach to grade schoolers. A conventional truth can be important. It's essential to learn elementary mathematics, for example, but it won't give you an edge. It's not a secret. Remember our contrarying question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? If we already understand as much of the natural world as we ever will, if all of today's conventional ideas are already enlightened, and if everything has already been done, then there are no good answers. Contrarian thinking doesn't make any sense unless the world still has secrets left to give up. Of course, there are many things we don't yet understand, but some of those things may be impossible to figure out, mysteries rather than secrets. For example, string theory describes the physics of the universe in terms of vibrating one-dimensional objects called strings. Is string theory true? You can't really design experiments to test it. Very few people, if any, could ever understand all its implications. But is that just because it's difficult? Or is it an impossible mystery? The difference matters. You can achieve difficult things, but you can't achieve the impossible. Recall the business version of our contrarian question. What valuable company is nobody building? Every correct answer is necessarily a secret, something important and unknown, something hard to do but doable. If there are many secrets left in the world, there are probably many world-changing companies yet to be started. This chapter will help you think about secrets and how to find them. Why aren't people looking for secrets? Most people act as if there were no secrets left to find. An extreme representative of this view is Ted Kaczynski, infamously known as the Unabomber. Kaczynski was a child prodigy who enrolled at Harvard at 16. He went on to get a PhD in math and become a professor at UC Berkeley. But you've only ever heard of him because of the 17-year terror campaign he waged with pipe bombs against professors, technologists, and business people. In late 1995, the authorities didn't know who or where the Unabomber was. The biggest clue was a 35,000-word manifesto that Kaczynski had written and anonymously mailed to the press. The FBI asked some prominent newspapers to publish it, hoping for a break in the case. It worked. Kaczynski's brother recognized his writing style and turned him in. You might expect that writing style to have shown obvious signs of insanity, but the manifesto is eerily cogent. Kaczynski claimed that in order to be happy, Every individual needs to have goals whose attainment requires effort, and needs to succeed in attaining at least some of his goals. He divided human goals into three groups. 1. Goals that can be satisfied with minimal effort. 2. Goals that can be satisfied with serious effort. And 3. Goals that cannot be satisfied, no matter how much effort one makes. This is the classic trichotomy of the easy, the hard, and the impossible. Kaczynski argued that modern people are depressed because all the world's hard problems have already been solved. What's left to do is either easy or impossible, and pursuing those tasks is deeply unsatisfying. 
What you can do, even a child can do. What you can't do, even Einstein couldn't have done. So Kaczynski's idea was to destroy existing institutions, get rid of all technology, and let people start over and work on hard problems anew. Kaczynski's methods were crazy, but his loss of faith in the technological frontier is all around us. Consider the trivial but revealing hallmarks of urban hipsterdom, faux vintage photography, the handlebar mustache, and vinyl record players all hark back to an earlier time when people were still optimistic about the future. If everything worth doing has already been done, you may as well feign an allergy to achievement and become a barista, hipster or unabomber. All fundamentalists think this way, not just terrorists and hipsters. Religious fundamentalism, for example, allows no middle ground for hard questions. There are easy truths that children are expected to rattle off, and then there are the mysteries of God, which can't be explained. In between, the zone of hard truths lies heresy. In the modern religion of environmentalism, the easy truth is that we must protect the environment. Beyond that, Mother Nature knows best, and she cannot be questioned. Free marketeers worship a similar logic. The value of things is set by the market. Even a child can look up stock quotes. But whether those prices make sense is not to be second-guessed. The market knows far more than you ever could. Why has so much of our society come to believe that there are no hard secrets left? It might start with geography. There are no blank spaces left on the map anymore. If you grew up in the 18th century, there were still new places to go. After hearing tales of foreign adventure, you could become an explorer yourself. This was probably true up through the 19th and early 20th centuries. After that point photography from National Geographic showed every Westerner what even the most exotic, underexplored places on Earth look like. Today, explorers are found mostly in history books and children's tales. Parents don't expect their kids to become explorers any more than they expect them to become pirates or sultans. Perhaps there are a few dozen uncontacted tribes somewhere deep in the Amazon. And we know there remains one last earthly frontier in the depths of the oceans. But the unknown seems less accessible than ever. Along with the natural fact that physical frontiers have receded, four social trends have conspired to root out belief in secret. First is incrementalism. From an early age, we are taught that the right way to do things is to proceed one very small step at a time, day by day, grade by grade. If you overachieve and end up learning something that's not on the test, you won't receive credit for it. But in exchange for doing exactly what's asked of you, you'll get into this process extends all the way up through the tenure track which is why academics usually chase large numbers of trivial publications instead of new frontiers. Second is risk aversion. People are scared of secrets because they are scared of being wrong. By definition, a secret hasn't been vetted by the mainstream. If your goal is to never make a mistake in your life, you shouldn't look for secrets. The prospect of being lonely but right, dedicating your life to something that no one else believes in, is already hard. The prospect of being lonely and wrong can be unbearable. Third is complacency. Social elites have the most freedom and ability to explore new thinking, but they seem to believe in secrets the least. Why search for a new secret if you can comfortably collect rents on everything that has already been done? Every fall, the deans at top law schools and business schools welcome the incoming class with the same implicit message, you got into this elite institution. Your worries are over. You're set for life. But that's probably the kind of thing that's true only if you don't believe it. Fourth is flatness. As globalization advances, people perceive the world as one homogeneous, highly competitive marketplace, the world is flat. Given that assumption, anyone who might have had the ambition to look for a secret will first ask himself, if it were possible to discover something new, wouldn't someone from the faceless global talent pool of smarter and more creative people have found it already? This voice of doubt can dissuade people from even starting to look for secrets in a world that seems too big a place for any individual to contribute something unique. There's an optimistic way to describe the result of these trends. Today, you can't start a cult. Forty years ago, people were more open to the idea that not all knowledge was widely known. From the Communist Party to the Hare Krishnas, large numbers of people thought they could join some enlightened vanguard that would show them the way. Very few people take unorthodox ideas seriously today, and the mainstream sees that as a sign of progress. We can be glad that there are fewer crazy cults now. Yet that gain has come at great cost. We have given up our sense of wonder at secrets left to be discovered. The world according to convention. How must you see the world if you don't believe in secrets? You'd have to believe we've already solved all great questions. If today's conventions are correct, we can afford to be smug and complacent. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. For example, a world without secrets would enjoy a perfect understanding of justice. Every injustice necessarily involves a moral truth that very few people recognize early on. In a democratic society, a wrongful practice persists only when most people don't perceive it to be unjust. At first, only a small minority of abolitionists knew that slavery was evil. 
That view has rightly become conventional, but it was still a secret in the early 19th century. To say that there are no secrets left today would mean that we live in a society with no hidden injustices. In economics, disbelief in secrets leads to faith in efficient markets, but the existence of financial bubbles shows that markets can have extraordinary inefficiencies. In 1999, nobody wanted to believe that the internet was irrationally overvalued. The same was true of housing in 2005. Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan had to acknowledge some signs of froth in local markets but stated that a bubble in home prices for the nation as a whole does not appear likely. The market reflected all noble information and couldn't be questioned. Then home prices fell across the country, and the financial crisis of 2008 wiped out trillions. The future turned out to hold many secrets that economists could not make vanish simply by ignoring them. What happens when a company stops believing in secrets? The sad decline of Hewlett-Packard provides a cautionary tale. In 1990, the company was worth $9 billion. Then came a decade of invention. In 1991, HP released the DeskJet 500, the world's first affordable color printer. In 1993, it launched the Omnibook, one of the first superportable laptops. The next year, HP released the Office Jet, the world's first all-in-one printer, fax, copier. This relentless product expansion paid off. By mid-2000, HP was worth $135 billion. But starting in late 1999, when HP introduced a new branding campaign around the imperative to invent, it stopped inventing things. In 2001, the company launched HP Services, a glorified consulting and support shop. In 2002, HP merged with Compaq, presumably because it didn't know what else to do. By 2005, the company's market cap had plunged to $70 billion, roughly half of what it had been just five years earlier. HP's board was a microcosm of the dysfunction. It split into two factions, only one of which cared about new technology. That faction was led by Tom Perkins, an engineer who first came to HP in 1963 to run the company's research division at the personal request of Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard. At 73 years old in 2005, Perkins may as well have been a time-traveling visitor from a bygone age of optimism. He thought the board should identify the most promising new technologies and then have HP build them. But Perkins's faction lost out to its rival, led by chairwoman Patricia Dunn. A banker by trade, Dunn argued that charting a plan for future technology was beyond the board's competence. She thought the board should restrict itself to a night watchman's role, was everything proper in the accounting department, were people following all the rules. Amid this infighting, someone on the board started leaking information to the press. When it was exposed that Dunn arranged a series of illegal wiretaps to identify the source, the backlash was worse than the original dissension, and the board was disgraced. Having abandoned the search for technological secrets, HP obsessed over gossip. As a result, by late 2012 HP was worth just $23 billion, not much more than it was worth in 1990, adjusting for inflation. The Case for Secrets You can't find secrets without looking for them. Andrew Wiles demonstrated this when he proved Fermat's last theorem after 358 years of fruitless inquiry by other mathematicians, the kind of sustained failure that might have suggested an inherently impossible task. Pierre de Fermat had conjectured in 1637 that no integers a, b, and c could satisfy the equation and plus b n equals c n for any integer n greater than 2. He claimed to have a proof, but he died without writing it down, so his conjecture long remained a major unsolved problem in mathematics. Wiles started working on it in 1986, but he kept it a secret until 1993, when he knew he was nearing a solution. After nine years of hard work, Wiles proved the conjecture in 1995. He needed brilliance to succeed, but he also needed a faith in secrets. If you think something hard is impossible, you'll never even start trying to achieve it. Belief in secrets is an effective truth. The actual truth is that there are many more secrets left to find, but they will yield only to relentless searchers. There is more to do in science, medicine, engineering, and in technology of all kinds. We are within reach not just of marginal goals set at the competitive edge of today's conventional disciplines, but of ambitions so great that even the boldest minds of the scientific revolution hesitated to announce them directly. We could cure cancer, dementia, and all the diseases of age and metabolic decay. We can find new ways to generate energy that free the world from conflict over fossil fuels. We can invent faster ways to travel from place to place over the surface of the planet. We can even learn how to escape it entirely and settle new frontiers. But we will never learn any of these secrets unless we demand to know them and force ourselves to look.
The same is true of business. Great companies can be built on open but unsuspected secrets about how the world works. Consider the Silicon Valley startups that have harnessed the spare capacity that is all around us but often ignored. Before Airbnb, travelers had little choice but to pay high prices for a hotel room, and property owners couldn't easily and reliably rent out their unoccupied space. Airbnb saw untapped supply and unaddressed demand where others saw nothing at all. The same is true of private car services Lyft and Uber. Few people imagined that it was possible to build a billion-dollar business by simply connecting people who want to go places with people willing to drive them there. We already had state-licensed taxicabs and private limousines. Only by believing in and looking for secrets could you see beyond the convention to an opportunity hidden in plain sight. The same reason that so many internet companies, including Facebook, are often underestimated. Their very simplicity is itself an argument for secrets. If insights that look so elementary in retrospect can support important and valuable businesses, there must remain many great companies still to start. How to find secrets There are two kinds of secrets, secrets of nature and secrets about people. Natural secrets exist all around us. To find them, one must study some undiscovered aspect of the physical world. Secrets about people are different. They are things that people don't know about themselves or things they hide because they don't want others to know. So when thinking about what kind of company to build, there are two distinct questions to ask. What secrets is nature not telling you? What secrets are people not telling you? It's easy to assume that natural secrets are the most important. The people who look for them can sound intimidatingly authoritative. This is why physics PhDs are notoriously difficult to work with, because they know the most fundamental truths. They think they know all truths. But does understanding electromagnetic theory automatically make you a great marriage counselor? Does a gravity theorist know more about your business than you do? At PayPal, I once interviewed a physics PhD for an engineering job. Halfway through my first question, he shouted, Stop, I already know what you're going to ask. But he was wrong. It was the easiest no-hire decision I've ever made. Secrets about people are relatively underappreciated. Maybe that's because you don't need a dozen years of higher education to ask the questions that uncover them. What are people not allowed to talk about? What is forbidden or taboo? Sometimes looking for natural secrets and looking for human secrets lead to the same truth. Consider the monopoly secret again. Competition and capitalism are opposites. If you didn't already know it, you could discover it the natural, empirical way. Do a quantitative study of corporate profits and you'll see they're eliminated by competition. But you could also take the human approach and ask, what are people running companies not allowed to say? You would notice that monopolists downplay their monopoly status to avoid scrutiny while competitive firms strategically exaggerate their uniqueness. The differences between firms only seem small on the surface, in fact, they are enormous. The best place to look for secrets is where no one else is looking. Most people think only in terms of what they've been taught. Schooling itself aims to impart conventional wisdom. So you might ask, are there any fields that matter but haven't been standardized and institutionalized? Physics, for example, is a real major at all major universities, and it's set in its ways. The opposite of physics might be astrology, but astrology doesn't matter. What about something like nutrition? Nutrition matters for everybody, but you can't major in it at Harvard. Most top scientists go into other fields. Most of the big studies were done 30 or 40 years ago, and most are seriously flawed. The food pyramid that told us to eat low-fat and enormous amounts of grains was probably more a product of lobbying by big food than real science. Its chief impact has been to aggravate our obesity epidemic. There's plenty more to learn. We know more about the physics of faraway stars than we know about human nutrition. It won't be easy, but it's not obviously impossible. Exactly the kind of field that could yield secrets. What to do with secrets? If you find a secret, you face a choice, do you tell anyone, or do you keep it to yourself? It depends on the secret, some are more dangerous than others. As Foss tells Wagner, the few who knew what might be learned, foolish enough to put their whole heart on show, and reveal their feelings to the crowd below. Mankind has always crucified and burned. Unless you have perfectly conventional beliefs, it's rarely a good idea to tell everybody everything that you know. So who do you tell? Whoever you need to, and no more. In practice, there's always a golden mean between telling nobody and telling everybody, and that's a company. The best entrepreneurs know this. Every great business is built around a secret that's hidden from the outside. A great company is a conspiracy to change the world. When you share your secret, the recipient becomes a fellow conspirator. As Tolkien wrote in The Lord of the Rings, the road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Life is a long journey. The road marked out by the steps of previous travelers has no end in sight. But later on in the tale, another verse appears. Still round the corner there may wait. A new road or a secret gate. And though we pass them by today, tomorrow we may come this way and take the hidden paths that run towards the moon or to the sun. The road doesn't have to be infinite after all.
Take the Hidden Paths Chapter 9 Foundations Every great company is unique, but there are a few things that every business must get right at the beginning. I stress this so often that friends have teasingly nicknamed it Thiel's Law. A startup messed up at its foundation cannot be fixed. Beginnings are special. They are qualitatively different from all that comes afterward. This was true 13.8 billion years ago. At the founding of our cosmos, in the earliest microseconds of its existence, the universe expanded by a factor of 1030 a million trillion trillion. As cosmogonic epochs came and went in those first few moments, the very laws of physics were different from those we know today. It was also true 227 years ago at the founding of our country. Fundamental questions were open for debate by the framers during the few months they spent together at the Constitutional Convention. How much power should the central government have? How should representation in Congress be apportioned? Whatever your views on the compromises reached that summer in Philadelphia, they've been hard to change ever since. After ratifying the Bill of Rights in 1791, we've amended the Constitution only 17 times. Today, California has the same representation in the Senate as Alaska, even though it has more than 50 times as many people. Maybe that's a feature, not a bug, but we're probably stuck with it as long as the United States exists. Another constitutional convention is unlikely. Today we debate only smaller questions. Companies are like countries in this way. Bad decisions made early on. If you choose the wrong partners or hire the wrong people, for example, are very hard to correct after they are made. It may take a crisis on the order of bankruptcy before anybody will even try to correct them. As a founder, your first job is to get the first things right, because you cannot build a great company on a flawed foundation. Founding Matrimony when you start something, the first and most crucial decision you make is whom to start it with. Choosing a co-founder is like getting married, and founder conflict is just as ugly as divorce. Optimism abounds at the start of every relationship. It's unromantic to think soberly about what could go wrong, so people don't. But if the founders develop irreconcilable differences, the company becomes the victim. In 1999, Luke Nosek was one of my co-founders at PayPal, and I still work with him today at Founders Fund. But a year before PayPal, I invested in a company Luke started with someone else. It was his first startup. It was one of my first investments. Neither of us realized it then. But the venture was doomed to fail from the beginning because Luke and his co-founder were a terrible match. Luke is a brilliant and eccentric thinker. His co-founder was an MBA type who didn't want to miss out on the 90 seconds gold rush. They met at a networking event, talked for a while, and decided to start a company together. That's no better than marrying the first person you meet at the slot machines in Vegas. You might hit the jackpot, but it probably won't work. Their company blew up and I lost my money. Now when I consider investing in a startup, I study the founding teams. Technical abilities and complementary skill sets matter, but how well the founders know each other and how well they work together matter just as much. Founders should share a prehistory before they start a company together, otherwise they're just rolling dice. Ownership, Possession, and Control It's not just founders who need to get along. Everyone in your company needs to work well together. A Silicon Valley libertarian might say you could solve this problem by restricting yourself to a sole proprietorship. Freud, Jung, and every other psychologist has a theory about how every individual mind is divided against itself. But in business at least, working for yourself guarantees alignment. Unfortunately, it also limits what kind of company you can build. It's very hard to go from zero to one without a team. A Silicon Valley anarchist might say you could achieve perfect alignment as long as you hire just the right people, who will flourish peacefully without any guiding structure. Serendipity and even free-form chaos at the workplace are supposed to help disrupt all the old rules made and obeyed by the rest of the world. And indeed, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. But anarchic companies miss what James Madison saw, men aren't angels. That's why executives who manage companies and directors who govern them have separate roles to play. It's also why founders and investors' claims on a company are formally defined. You need good people who get along, but you also need a structure to help keep everyone aligned for the long term. To anticipate likely sources of misalignment in any company, it's useful to distinguish between three concepts. Ownership. Who legally owns a company's equity? Possession. Who actually runs the company on a day-to-day -day basis? Control. Who formally governs the company's affairs? A typical startup allocates ownership among founders, employees, and investors. The managers and employees who operate the company enjoy possession. And a board of directors, usually comprising founders and investors, exercises control. In theory, this division works smoothly. Financial upside from part ownership attracts and rewards investors and workers. Effective possession motivates and empowers founders and employees. It means they can get stuff done. 
oversight from the board places managers' plans in a broader perspective. In practice, distributing these functions among different people makes sense, but it also multiplies opportunities for misalignment. To see misalignment at its most extreme, just visit the DMV. Suppose you need a new driver's license. Theoretically, it should be easy to get one. The DMV is a government agency, and we live in a democratic republic. All power resides in the people, who elect representatives to serve them in government. If you're a citizen, you're a part owner of the DMV and your representatives control it, so you should be able to walk in and get what you need. Of course, it doesn't work like that. We the people may own the DMV's resources, but that ownership is merely fictional. The clerks and petty tyrants who operate the DMV, however, enjoy very real possession of their small-time powers. Even the governor and the legislature charged with nominal control over the DMV can't change anything. The bureaucracy lurches ever sideways of its own inertia no matter what actions elected officials take. Accountable to nobody, the DMV is misaligned with everybody. Bureaucrats can make your licensing experience pleasurable or nightmarish at their sole discretion. You can try to bring up political theory and remind them that you are the boss, but that's unlikely to get you better service. Big corporations do better than the DMV, but they're still prone to misalignment, especially between ownership and possession. The CEO of a huge company like General Motors, for example, will own some of the company's stock, but only a trivial portion of the total. Therefore he's incentivized to reward himself through the power of possession rather than the value of ownership. Posting good quarterly results will be enough for him to keep his high salary and corporate jet. Misalignment can creep in even if he receives stock compensation in the name of shareholder value. If that stock comes as a reward for short-term performance, he will find it more lucrative and much easier to cut costs instead of investing in a plan that might create more value for all shareholders far in the future. Unlike corporate giants, early-stage startups are small enough that founders usually have both ownership and possession. Most conflicts in a startup erupt between ownership and control, that is, between founders and investors on the board. The potential for conflict increases over time as interests diverge. A board member might want to take a company public as soon as possible to score a win for his venture firm, while the founders would prefer to stay private and grow the business. In the boardroom, less is more. The smaller the board, the easier it is for the directors to communicate, to reach consensus, and to exercise effective oversight. However, that very effectiveness means that a small board can forcefully oppose management in any conflict. This is why it's crucial to choose wisely. Every single member of your board matters. Even one problem director will cause you pain, and may even jeopardize your company's future. A board of three is ideal. Your board should never exceed five people, unless your company is publicly held. By far the worst you can do is to make your board extra large. When unsavvy observers see a nonprofit organization with dozens of people on its board, they think, look how many great people are committed to this organization. It must be extremely well run. Actually, a huge board will exercise no effective oversight at all. It merely provides cover for whatever microdictator actually runs the organization. If you want that kind of free reign from your board, blow it up to giant size. If you want an effective board, keep it small. On the bus or off the bus. As a general rule, everyone you involve with your company should be involved full-time. Sometimes you'll have to break this rule. It usually makes sense to hire outside lawyers and accountants, for example. However, anyone who doesn't own stock options or draw a regular salary from your company is fundamentally misaligned. At the margin, they'll be biased to claim value in the near term, not help you create more in the future. That's why hiring consultants doesn't work. Part-time employees don't work. Even working remotely should be avoided, because misalignment can creep in whenever colleagues aren't together full-time, in the same place, every day. If you're deciding whether to bring someone on board, the decision is binary. Ken Kesey was right. You're either on the bus or off the bus. Cash is not king. For people to be fully committed, they should be properly compensated. Whenever an entrepreneur asks me to invest in his company, I ask him how much he intends to pay himself. A company does better the less it pays the CEO. That's one of the single clearest patterns I've noticed from investing in hundreds of startups. In no case should a CEO of an early stage, venture-backed startup receive more than $150,000 per year in salary. It doesn't matter if he got used to making much more than that at Google or if he has a large mortgage and hefty private school tuition bills. If a CEO collects $300,000 per year, he risks becoming more like a politician than a founder. High pay incentivizes him to defend the status quo along with his salary, not to work with everyone else to surface problems and fix them aggressively. A cash-poor executive, by contrast, will focus on increasing the value of the company as a whole. Low CEO pay also sets the standard for everyone else. Aaron Levy, the CEO of Box, was always careful to pay himself less than everyone else in the company. 
Four years after he started Box, he was still living two blocks away from HQ in a one-bedroom apartment with no furniture except a mattress. Every employee noticed his obvious commitment to the company's mission and emulated it. If a CEO doesn't set an example by taking the lowest salary in the company, he can do the same thing by drawing the highest salary. So long as that figure is still modest, it sets an effective ceiling on cash compensation. Cash is attractive. It offers pure optionality. Once you get your paycheck, you can do anything you want with it. However, high cash compensation teaches workers to claim value from the company as it already exists instead of investing their time to create new value in the future. A cash bonus is slightly better than a cash salary. At least it's contingent on a job well done. But even so-called incentive pay encourages short-term thinking and value grabbing. Any kind of cash is more about the present than the future. Vested Interests Startups don't need to pay high salaries because they can offer something better, part ownership of the company itself. Equity is the one form of compensation that can effectively orient people toward creating value in the future. However, for equity to create commitment rather than conflict, you must allocate it very carefully. Giving everyone equal shares is usually a mistake. Every individual has different talents and responsibilities as well as different opportunity costs, so equal amounts will seem arbitrary and unfair from the start. On the other hand, granting different amounts up front is just as sure to seem unfair. Resentment at this stage can kill a company, but there's no ownership formula to perfectly avoid it. This problem becomes even more acute over time as more people join the company. Early employees usually get the most equity because they take more risk but some later employees might be even more crucial to a venture's success. A secretary who joined eBay in 1996 might have made 200 times more than her industry veteran boss who joined in 1999. The graffiti artist who painted Facebook's office walls in 2005 got stock that turned out to be worth $200 million, while a talented engineer who joined in 2010 might have made only $2 million. Since it's impossible to achieve perfect fairness when distributing ownership, Founders would do well to keep the details secret. Sending out a company-wide email that lists everyone's ownership stake would be like dropping a nuclear bomb on your office. Most people don't want equity at all. At PayPal, we once hired a consultant who promised to help us negotiate lucrative business development deals. The only thing he ever successfully negotiated was a $5,000 daily cash salary. He refused to accept stock options as payment. Stories of startup chefs becoming millionaires notwithstanding, people often find equity unattractive. It's not liquid like cash. It's tied to one specific company. And if that company doesn't succeed, it's worthless. Equity is a powerful tool precisely because of these limitations. Anyone who prefers owning a part of your company to being paid in cash reveals a preference for the long term and a commitment to increasing your company's value in the future. Equity can't create perfect incentives but it's the best way for a founder to keep everyone in the company broadly aligned. Extending the founding Bob Dylan has said that he who is not busy being born is busy dying. If he's right, being born doesn't happen at just one moment. You might even continue to do it somehow, poetically at least. The founding moment of a company, however, really does happen just once. Only at the very start do you have the opportunity to set the rules that will align people toward the creation of value in the future. The most valuable kind of company maintains an openness to invention that is most characteristic of beginnings. This leads to a second, less obvious understanding of the founding. It lasts as long as a company is creating new things, and it ends when creation stops. If you get the founding moment right, you can do more than create a valuable company. You can steer its distant future toward the creation of new things instead of the stewardship of inherited success. You might even extend its founding indefinitely.